I think we're live. Yay, wait for the yellow button. We are live. Hi, everybody. It's Wednesday. It's 4 o'clock in the East Coast, 2 o'clock for me. Um, I'm not sure over in the UK. I think it's 8 p.m. over there. So 4 o'clock <laughs> Eastern and all points around the globe. Um, and we are ready for Healthy You. We are going to focus on the category Healthy Mind today. We have Many St. Victor, who hopefully everybody watched those four girls earlier as they explored the topic of social media manipulation and it was a fantastic conversation. Now we get to meet the man behind the message. Um, Manny, we're going to talk about your path. So welcome everybody out in the comment stream. I see some stuff going by and we're just going to jump on in there. Um, Manny, tell us about your start. Uh, well, I had a traditional start. Well. I was uh, born in Brooklyn, but I spent my childhood in Haiti till I was seven because uh, my parents were still in college. Then uh, I moved to New York, moved to Florida, and then went to Harvard for undergrad, went to um, and took some time off to learn business, went to Chapel Hill for medical school, took some time off to learn business and software engineering, which I had been doing before that, then went and did my psychiatry residency. And finally two years into that I was like this is not what I want to do with my life because the more I got to know the neuroscience uh, the more I felt that the dependent model that medicine uses where we kind of make you relying on uh, reliant on medications and a physician in a white coat somewhere powerful to me that was kind of a subjugating model because I'm a big believer in self-determination theory where essentially everything you need is within you if the environment nurtures you appropriately. So ideally you would help someone work towards agency, um, competence, and a sense of relatedness. So purpose, passion, meaning. And I don't feel that someone outside handing you a pill that they've placeboed you into thinking controls your uh, immune system through marketing is the ideal use of my skill set. So I decided to come out and at Mindful360 we use an approach where we, we do non-stigmatized, non-pathologized healthcare where we coach people into being their best self. If someone happens to need um, psychiatric or medical care, we have um, the office in Miami. We have a Palm Beach office, and that way it's not such a um, self-deprecating, self-destructive um, experience. You know, mental, um, mental health should be something where when you need to reach out to someone, you don't have to go to some weird place in the back of the hospital where it's private and it's embarrassing and you hope no one sees you. It should be the kind of thing where you hop on, you get support from a, a network of like-minded people, not someone behind a table with a white coat checking stuff off and saying, mm -hmm, when you know, as soon as they're not around you, they're doing the same things, they're just not labeling it because it's done in a different socioeconomic class. And so, that was that was the energy behind my motivation to try to car, to try to a create a path where I was able to help people get better through developing a mastery of their way of thinking to um, developing a more balanced relationships, healthier relationships, knowing when to walk away from a relationship, um, communicating with their kids in such a way that their kids grow up with a sense of being nurtured, heard, and empowered, such that they will seek better relationships. Uh, engaging with brands and organizations that support your core values and are aligned with your view and knowing when to stop using a product uh, if they violate their brand message or brand promise because that is another relationship and that does affect your self-esteem. Those relationships are symbolic relationships as well. So that's me in a nutshell, I think. But let me know if I left anything out. Um, well, that's a huge big nutshell, Manny. Um, <laughs> What did it, you and I talked about this when we first talked? Um, a hangout a couple of weeks ago. What did your parents think as you <laughs> left? What did your I think you were married at the time. Um, what did your social network think of you're leaving medicine? Yeah. You're going to go do what? Um, you know, because making these huge life choices to be happy to fulfill your purpose is 
something that's so against the norm that not everybody has the courage to go do. I'd like to hear about how that all came about for you. Oh, look, when I first quit, I didn't tell, I, I was living in Atlanta and I hadn't told my dad for like at least seven, eight months. And, you know, he thought I was still in residency and I was trying to figure out how to tell him. But when I told him, uh, you know, he was concerned. And, you know, when I was, uh, when we were trying to start the company, uh, when we had whatever stumbling blocks before we had um, traction, and every once in a while he'd be like, well, you know, you need to go find a hospital to be at that where they're feeding you patients that the government's paying for or whatever, you know, the traditional model. Um, and, you know, I mean, it just, I don't want to feel empty. At the end of the day, I, the friends that are true friends are the ones that can see inside me enough to know what I went through in training. Um, some people like to pretend that, um, you know, especially from the outside, that um, you've lost your mind because you walked away from the perfect life, but they're always defining the perfect life from the outside. They weren't the ones that were stuck in a hospital 30 hours at a time. You know, they weren't the ones that got attacked by psychiatric inpatients. They weren't the ones dealing with criminals all the time. And at the end of the day, my worldview, working with people on a diagnostic level all day, meant that when I wasn't in the hospital, my cognitive habits were such that I'm talking to someone and I'm going through a checklist of what's wrong with them psychiatrically. And that's idiotic. That's a negative frame to go through life in. And I was going to waste my life away just for that. And plus, I, I knew that at one point it dawned on me that I was sucking up so much of my brain power learning pharmaceuticals that I could be using to look towards um, actual neurophysiological mechanisms like mindfulness and contemplative neuroscience to help people without getting some pills find their way towards health. And that really bothered did, me. Did you, did you go back for some education in regards to um, helping people without pharmaceuticals? Um, I, 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 I called you my shrink the first time we talked, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a check for this therapy session too. Um, but coming out of what I came out of six years ago, it was a conscious choice for me to not go the pharmaceutical route. And it took me interviewing about 15 um, psychiatrists and psychologists before I found one who would take me through cognitive therapy with no medication. Um, so did you have to go back through some homeopathic, some DOM education to figure out how people can help themselves, how you can guide them through this, um, this practice that you have now that is not pharmaceutical based? Nah, I decided to go. Um, <laughs> I, I decided to go real with it. You know? I, you know, you know. I'll tell you what. I, I went into money detox. I, I dropped from money and power and, and narcissist detox. I went from a position of power at a hospital. You know, um, at the time I took a job with a, a virtual world company because I've been programming computers since I was like ten. And this company gave me one hundred fifty thousand a year, and I was like, okay, I can live on that. Um, and, you know, and at first it was like, okay, I'll be all right, and it's not too big a drop in lifestyle. They crashed and burned. And so then, you know, I was like, okay. Um, so I think what I got to see was how people in different classes think, because up until then I had read about people not having coping skills and stuff, and it's not until you're in a situation where, like in medicine, you were okay. You knew that there was always going to be somebody needing a physician. But when I was working software um, and trying to start the company, then it's like, okay, what if I fail before I can feed my family? You know, what if, um, what if whatever? You know, the security of, of being in that position in society doesn't exist. And plus, there's this thing where when you change social economic status, you have to there's different things you have to deal with. Like when I was in Miami, if you were speeding and you had your white coat on the back of your um, of your seat and you got pulled over, the cop would be like, well, uh, you're probably on the way to the hospital, weren't you, doc? And you're like, yeah, that's where I was headed. <laughs> and you don't get those benefits when you're just like there. You're just some dude, you know? And to me, getting to know myself outside of this identity that I was using as a crutch was my detox. That's fantastic. Um, for you to think of your 
chosen career as something you needed to detox from. Um, do you find in your practice now that that people who don't have the mindfulness are detoxing from society and social norms and I have to do this and you know we talk a lot on the plus about the entrepreneurial spirit and some of us entrepreneurs are breaking all barriers um, and and really stepping out of what should be you know the 40 40 40 kind of existence that we all talk about but um, I do want to ask a question um, unless Kirsten has it up. Do you have Kevin's question for Manny on there? You got to unmute yourself, honey. Sorry, I was just keeping quiet in the corner. <laughs> um, uh, Kevin Burns um, was keeping me entertained because he's saying, hola, mi amigos on the panel, host viewers and the brainy audience. I thought that was very funny. but um, And then he, he he's asked, actually, um, of Manny, does your dad see your vision better now compared to the first moment you told him about deep sixing the psych residency program? Can, can you rephrase that question in a way that I can like, like not have an argument with my dad? traditional. They, they, um, um, you know, in their ideal parental role, it was like, okay, we worked hard, we got these kids into Ivy League schools, we got these kids through med school, um, whew, we can breathe a sigh of relief, and you know, they're like, you're going to do what? So it's sort of, I think, um, it's hard to explain to my parents that, um, you know, it's like, sometimes some, some people perceive that like status and money will make everything okay, and it doesn't, it doesn't, because um, you end up doing materialistic things symbolically to try to reach a point of comfort and happiness and as soon as you buy the next whatever biggest size thing up a couple days later you see someone with something bigger and you're like ah, gotta go get the bigger one and it's just it's an empty way to be until you reach inside and find like your core values in your engine such that you're competing in your own lane and you're fulfilled and you don't deal with envy when other people succeed because you know that you know there's, you're not competing with anyone to be yourself. You're not competing, with, so that's kind of one of those things that's kind of hard to explain to some people. But I'm not a magician, so I can't worry about that. And, and I guess you're in a unique position because you've been through that path, so you see it from a different perspective. Whereas a lot of people who are in your situation wouldn't have fallen on hard times, and so they wouldn't have known and been able to relate to that situation to deal with people. Yeah, it's it's um, one of the most. Um, it was painful at the time, but one of the most um, what's the transformational aspects of um, pulling out of medicine is that you got to hear what people really think about you, what they meant to tell you when you went off to whatever college, when you when they were at your graduation, so called supporting you. You got to like, yeah, because people open up really wide when they're giving you advice. You know, now that now that you're kind of down on your luck, you know, they're like, it's like they've been waiting for it. You know, it's like almost orgasmic. It's like, hey, man, glad to hear from you. I'm like, I know. I was talking to your mom. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure you were. <laughs> I noticed you called me seven times ever since, you know, I've moved to Atlanta. And, you know, and then you just, it's an opportunity to hear what people really think. And then if, if you're the kind of person that lets that get you down, then, you know, you might not have the fuel to do what you need to do. You might let it put you back into your cultural role or script, but, you know. Um, in, in, in that, how important, we were talking in the green room about community, um, and you were married when all this was going on, correct? Mm -hmm. And did you have a, a good sit down with your wife and say, you know, we want happiness more than the BMW? We want happiness more than um, the trappings of what life is supposed to be. Um, you know, more than it, what your parents built for you because that's what was supposed to be built for you. They work hard to provide you and your your sibling with a, a, the Ivy League education, and then oh gosh, now he's not living it. Um, 
had, talk about as your friends are doing this. It, it had to have been hard. Um, you had, you know, your loving wife to come home to and get a hug, or was that like you're crazy, dude? But I love you, so I'm sticking with you. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, y'all in these questions. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna have to go with. Yeah, I think it's it's um. My wife's a pragmatic person, okay, so she, she worried, and I mean, she's still worried now because I, I think I have like an idiot's level of risk tolerance. You know, I'm really optimistic and sometimes not necessarily cautiously optimistic, you know. And um, one thing that is hard to capture is in our society, there's this subtle difference, and it's not so subtle. The more grooves you go through downwards, there's a subtle difference in people's attitudes um, as far as everything from the way you're treated in restaurants to the difference in sounds in BMW doors <laughs> to the height of the rooms in your house to the width of the doors in your house to the thickness of the walls in your house. These are not things you think about until you decide, like, you know, let me see what it's like outside of the bubble. And you're like, wow, do you really have to be this mean to people on a, on a bus, you know? Like, if you ride a Greyhound, you're like, wow, this is fascinating. So um, I I think it's, it's it, it grows you a bit to realize when you're telling someone they need to get better coping skills that you're talking to someone who maybe lives in a neighborhood where every once in a while their coping skills involve hearing bullets go rattling past. And you know, and I, I didn't like make that drastic a life change, but just by, you know, moving out of what I consider the bubble, the ivory tower where all cats talk about was vacation, golf, and all that crap, moving into a reality where people talk about when you're watching the news and you see there's an unemployment rate, you feel it in your chest like, oh, that's scary. You know, when it affects you because you're in a field where that might affect things and seeing software companies lay off people and departments get shut down. It's a different experience when it's palpable. It's a different experience in the first person subjective. Are you able, I mean, are, are, are we, and again, we're going to have to pay you for the session, are we as a society able to say, I understand that's going on because I'm watching, you know, the news. I don't own a TV, haven't for 11 years, very proud of that. But we're watching the news and we have those palpitations and maybe we live in a community where the reality is a bullet going by. Um, where do we find the help we need to have the courage you had um, to break free from that. Um, where do we find it, Manny? I mean, I obviously uh, Mindful 360, but um, where does the aver average person go to say, I am breaking out of this. Happiness is more important than my surroundings, than what's going on on TV. I can pray for them and have empathy for, for the situation, but I have the courage because I have a, a savant's fear of, of failure. Um, I'm just going to do it, damn it, and, and get it done. I, I take the mindset that you have to find a community of like-minded people that share your values, and you want mentors that are more successful than you enough such that you can emulate upwards. Um, because um, the tendency is to find a bunch of your buddies and try to start a business, and that doesn't work. You need a coach who's already done this stuff. You know, I, I've been fortunate where... Uh, initially, I met Craig a few years back, and um, so Craig taught me a lot of the stuff that I needed to know along the way to uh, apply the neuroscience from medicine to marketing aspects, to business aspects. Um, I've uh, met Kellen, Kellen Flukiger, who's um, been teaching me a lot of the aspects of you know just execution as a as an executive, like it just that approach. Um, I've been fortunate. Uh, that I bumped into Ammon, Ammon Johns, and, you know, that was like, you know, I mean, I, I basically, now he has the show called Ammonized, so it's like, I guess I was Ammonized before it was being Ammonized. It's just, when you, um, I think the key thing, if you think about every, I think about everything like with a uh, genetics model, uh, evolution model, 
um, you, you need to be efficient. You're like the, the algorithm that you use for survival is regret minimalization, which means that you got to understand when you made a mistake, lose as little energy as possible emotionally, um, and as little self-esteem damage as possible from that mistake, and back up, see where you made the mistake, learn to not make that mistake again, and move forward. And so that's where having mentors that you trust that are like more experienced than you and who are older in the game and coaches to keep you going, that's the lifesaver, I think. That's the determinant because a lot of the stuff I've learned about business is just counterintuitive. It's like I would have never tried it that way. And where is the um, the the neuroplasticity sets in? I'm a huge follower of Sean Acor. Um, it, he is just absolutely one of my heroes. He he was the first person who I found that actually, and and through a TED talk, and then watching him do speeches live, um, the the ability for us to practice and train our brains. Um, I, I want to bring up one of Kevin's conversation or uh, points because he says, if I can get my eyeball to work, developing the brain should be viewed to be no different than developing your body. Master your way of thinking as compared to aerobics or fitness training. Think about the cues. So that's an amazing thing we can do as we're seeking a mentor um, to change our thought patterns to be able to find somebody who is like-minded, maybe a little bit above us like-mindedness, and say, teach me something. I don't know a mentor on the planet that's not willing to teach you something. So, but how do we start changing our brains to say, um, I, I want to work out. You know, you start workout, you walk 30 minutes around the block, and then eventually you're running a 5K. Yeah. Where does that start in the brain, Nanny? It starts with breathing. <laughs> it starts with breathing because um, resilience is anchored in what's called high frequency heart rate variability. Uh, when you breathe and you pay attention to your breathing, it gets boring. And by training your brain to return to the breathing, you're training uh, the network in your brain that can pull you away from emotional distraction, that can pull you away from impulsive behavior. And it, it sinks your heart and your brain, because your emotions are really a combination of heart brain. It's called the um, well, it's called the uh, neurocardio axis. And when you meditate, you end up with a synchrony between your heart and your brain. When you meditate, you end up with a synchrony between your heart and your gut lining, which is sort of your intuition at times when you get a gut feeling. Um, what you want to be able to do, and this is um, meditation, allows you to move from premature sympathetic fight flight. Um, responses to using your inner signal as a core compass and exercising and, you know, and Craig wrote it, my partner Craig wrote it, we, we call it cognitive yoga. When you exercise, I, a lot of times pharmaceutical companies talk about serotonin uptake inhibitors and that's in the gap, there's serotonin in the gap, but when you exercise and you meditate you trigger uh, brain derived natriuretic, uh, the neurotropic factor, BDNF. Um, BDNF it's the difference between duct tape and the pieces of the road and allowing the entire highway to just kind of get a bath regeneration. So instead of trying to pop pills to fix things, you go walk, you meditate, um, you spend time with friends and you relax and let the oxytocin kick in. And these things, um, they work on a holistic, healthy level. You're not duct taping your system together. You sleep enough hours a night because during that time, your brain consolidates emotional memory. If you're, if you're not getting enough sleep, you're going to have less willpower the next day. That's just flat out because 30% of your, if you lose sleep, you lose 30% of your DNA being transcribed. Really? Yeah. And emotional consolidation, which is the process through which you get wiser from your emotional experiences, happens in your sleep. If you're not getting enough sleep, you're not consolidating the memories and the lessons you learned that day. You're wasting living, <laughs> basically. Well, um, I sleep a lot. Um, I used to be in my 20s, I used to be an insomniac, but I, I don't anymore. Um, and I've started practicing through some, some very good mentors, is doing um, in my gratitude journal every night before I go to bed, um, I tell a story of the day. 
and um, you know it could have been just my husband did the dishes but um, rather than writing my husband did the dishes um, really bring the emotion out of you know I didn't have to ask him and he cleaned the kitchen and even wiped off the counter and even you know clean the little drainy things and oh my house is beautiful and all the emotion that that so I can go to bed with that positive feeling um, and then theoretically you can correct me I'm sure um, you know your brain's looking for the positive fun stuff and theoretically you'll have better dreams as opposed to watching you know the news before you go to sleep and you've got all that death and violence in your head and that's what you think about and dream about yep I mean that's exactly right um, they say that um, they had a study where they would have women like watch something comical or you know just anything that triggered laughter before breastfeeding their kids and the kids slept better because of the melatonin spike triggered by the laughter you know, melatonin is spiked by laughter mm -hmm. I did not know that. Yeah, uh, everything in your body works based off of some natural behavior that you do. That's what the system was for. A hundred years ago, they weren't lobbing Zoloft, you know, into evolution. Like we've taken a road off because someone with a lot of influence decided to do some systematic, motivated cognition in one direction. Like most of that stuff works, mindfulness-based um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Acceptance-based cognitive behavioral therapy. These are showing permanent changes. It's showing neuroplasticity. You lose your neuroplasticity. You lose your ability to control your own brain when enough life stress kicks in that a part of your brain called the default mode network starts firing differently, and then you see an external locus of control. You become like, oh, the universe is killing me. It's, uh, you can think of it in depression as learned helplessness. You know, it's it's a sense that you won't try anymore because every other case has been a defeat, but. Mm -hmm. Um, by becoming more mindful, by learning to differentiate your negative emotions and spending more time with them, you, you're able to make finer grade responses to life's events. You don't over respond. You don't under respond. You're more patient. You don't self sabotage, cause arguments in your household. You don't, you know, get arrested for fighting in the street. You don't, um, you know, substance abuse is all triggered by a certain what, like set points within your system where your body gets to a certain point and it's like I need a drink or I need whatever I need a smoke I need for stress eating all that stuff is based off your body looking for a certain signal to move it away from that pain point and when you become more mindful you're able to more deliberately choose the things that you put in to satisfy something you don't have to be as much of a gourmand you become like a gourmet you know you're like okay I'm craving you know, and I'm a, I'm a, a ENTP. I use Myers Briggs because it's a good architecture system. You know, just some general categories. But I'm an ENTP. If I feel myself going into a stress mode, what some people some people call amygdala hijack, where you know some of my less advantageous functions are kicking in, the way I can flip out of that mode is uh, with chick flicks, basically. You know, uh, something that uses my feeling function, which is my third function. And everyone has a third function that they can use to flip themselves into better functioning. Like my wife is um, an ESTJ is what they call it. And with her, when she's at a point of frustration, you wanna use, um, you wanna use, I think with her, you wanna use her thinking function. You wanna use logic to pull my wife out. Like you wanna externalize the logic for her and explain to her, you know, not, not no warm, fuzzy, huggy stuff, because she doesn't kill that. <laughs> you know, um, you, want, you wanna like kinda give her a, a version of the model from outside her head so she can see a path to the solution and then she'll de-escalate, you know, into more frontal lobe thinking. And a lot of times when someone falls out of effective thinking, if they get stuck in the grip and they spiral and they spiral, you have psychosis. Yeah. And a that lot of times you can avoid that. That's fascinating. So you're in watching beaches, and um, she's trying to logically think her way out of an argument. This is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Little glimpse into Manny's path. Um, yeah. I'm going to go watch <laughs> beaches right now, honey. I'll be fine. <laughs> you know, I'm in the notebook. I'll be like, okay, I'm better. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, what's your favorite chick go-to uh, chick flick? But it's the uh, notebook. Yeah, we got to go notebook with it. We tried atonement, but at the end, when they let you know the part didn't really happen, I was like, yo, that was the opposite of cognitive closure. <laughs> I like we could have like cut that movie off 30 minutes ago, and I would have been like, okay, he got what he deserved. I mean, she got what she deserved, but it broke it for me. But yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> can I, sorry, can I just pull up um, uh, Craig's, um, just put a reference to the article in like today on BD N and F. So that's really helpful. Thanks for doing that, Craig. And there's a couple of questions in here. Um, uh, Peter has asked about what about yeah, you mentioned that to me. I haven't had a chance to dig into the pathways of that yet. Okay. I, so. He sent me some good information about that. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm sure that you can follow it up later. Oh yeah. No, I'll geek out on it. He you knows. <laughs> oh um, well, when 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 you geek out on that, um, uh, you know, put up a post and ping me in it. I'm okay. curious because my, I, like I said, my my happiness guru is Sean, so I'd like to see that one. Okay. Now, are one thing. More? Kirsten, are there any more? Oh, sorry, I was just saying that um, Kevin's being a bit cheeky about um, Marnie teaching us about what oxytocin is. I certainly know because I have had three children. <laughs> so I, yeah. thank you, Kevin, for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are. I cannot even believe we've been talking for uh, our allotted thirty minutes. Um, but it, we've gotten um, a really good sense of your path and how you got that way, um, both mentally, spiritually, emotionally, mindfulnessly. Um, where are you going now? Because I don't mind going a few minutes over to hear where you guys, um, where you are going now, especially with what you're doing with Mindful 360, Manny. Um, well, what we've done is by bringing in uh, Dr. Ritvo, uh, she's got 25 years, uh, including helping um, disruptive physicians, and you know she's got extensive training. What we're able to do is create sort of a start to finish. Uh, non-stigmatizing mechanism where you can you can get coaching, uh, you can get advanced coaching, you can get coaching to pull you out of an almost psychotic event, uh, or if you end up in a situation where you end up in psychosis, uh, you know we'll have clinics like what right now like the South Beach office, the Miami Beach office is where we're doing most of our inpatient care for like medications and stuff, but we're able to focus away from those things because at the end of the day the benefit of health care is if you keep someone healthy. So my model is that I hope to introduce more physicians to the concept of developing empathic understanding relationships with your patients where it's not like once every few months you, you drop by, they drop by the HMO spot and they get whoever's next on the rotation because it was the relationships that are making people healthier and giving them the information, the advice. So my hope is that uh, the physicians that decide to trust and follow me can learn a a more mindful approach to entrepreneurship, and b how to build more empathic, supportive, reciprocal relationships with their patients. And really, I, I mean, you don't really even need to be calling humans patients because the second you do that, you've kind of pulled yourself up into doctor identity and subjugated them into a third person subjective box. Yeah, I mean, there's two human beings. It's always been that relationships help people get healthier. So somebody put a price on that and decided that now they're gonna make a scarcity of balanced relationships and then have you have a relationship with someone that they've kind of used space repetition to convince you is knowledgeable and authoritative and make you compliant and now you get healthy through a pill. That needs that needs a rework. So my hope is that like with with the increase of information and looking at different models, maybe we can change the way people think about that. So is is Mindful 360 just for the physician, or can anybody out there who needs a reset, who is thinking, I am trapped on this path, um, I, I, I know I, I'm not happy, I know this is not fulfilling me, how do I break out of it? Let me go to Mindful 360 and figure it out. Can anybody Absolutely. go there? Yeah, we, we're two things for that. One is that we have, uh, if you go to the site, we... Um, have a coaching link where we provide um, different styles of coaching from a package where you can work with one of us or um, a set where you can set up like a monthly plan where you get to see one of each of us along the way at different times. Uh, in some cases, if you do need some monthly medication adjustment, then we can schedule that as well. Um, if you just want to uh, interpersonal skills training or just personality assessment and just getting to know sort of how your subconscious mind works. Um, so we have that, and I'm working on core value alignment, which is going to be a, a series 
that people can use to find their core values because your core values are the gateway to awareness, to self-awareness, to, um, to agency. And just by activating your core values when you make a decision, you make decisions such that you aim your like life vector towards what you're most suited for, a more purpose-driven, uh, meaningful, passionate life. So. Do you did you have um, before you made this leap and and uh, and walked away from your residency? Did you have your core values in place? I I don't know that many of us walking the planet now who are not on this path even know what our core values are. No, I, I knew I knew that something was out of place though. Okay. And it's just um, you know, the key thing is like that I remember is um. At one point, when I knew it was time to let it go, was I'd be driving to work and be like, you know, if I fell asleep and got hit head on, that way my parents wouldn't be ashamed of me having committed suicide, but I can get out of this misery. And to think of living that for the rest of my life was kind of like suboptimal, to say the least. <laughs> and so, you know, I knew I had to, like, I knew something had to change. And so when I pulled away um, from the culture of medicine, the repetition, the everyone else thinking like I do, then it gave me an opportunity to look into just the raw data, to just do the research myself, look at the psychophysics of it, look at other schools of thinking, look into philosophy, um, and see like parallels and patterns, and see what works. I'm telling you, you are an amazing person, Manny. Thank you, I appreciate this. Um, I, I Kirsten, I, I, my mind is reeling, so I'm going to let you talk <laughs> because I, I'm just going to babble. Um, we. I was just, I was really just thinking about how, you know, when people just take that time to stand back and to reflect and to look, how then they can be open to possibilities in their life. And I, I think. You know, so much of the time we spend in this rat race that we live in, you're going from one thing to the next, and and you know, I've got all these things I need to get done, and then I'm here, and I'm taking people here, and I'm doing this and that, and then, but if we just stop and breathe and sit back and think, then that will help us be happier in our mind to think about what we want. Absolutely, I think that's true. That it, so the message, the takeaway for um, Healthy Mind today with Manny is um, do a self-check. Um, do you know your core values? Um, or are you like Manny, just feeling trapped and lost and, and you know that what you're doing is not getting you where you want to go? It's not fulfilling your passion. It's not feeding your passion. Um, maybe reaching out, finding that support group, finding uh, a place to say, where do I need to go? Um, how do I need to reevaluate? What are some steps I can take so that, um, so that you do find that hope, so that you do understand that no matter what society or family or mom and dad um, think you're supposed to be, you can be whatever you want to be as long as you look within. Um, and that's my closing, um, that's my hope for the planet, that's why I built Healthy You, um, so that people can find a place to find like-minded, to find, um, you know, I think health is much more than a treadmill and a piece of broccoli, or kale, because kale is all the rage now, um, but um, a place that we can in, inspire each other to look within and find mind and find spirit um, and, and find all of the elements that go into what is a healthy um, me so that I can be healthy for you so that you can be healthy for others. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye and I'm going to let Manny close us out with where we can find him and, um, and then we'll be just about 10 minutes late um, ending the broadcast, but it, I couldn't stop it. So, Manny, um, tell us where to find you and how we can reach out. Uh, you can find me at mindful360.com. And you can either call us or you could contact us through the forms, or you could sign up for the core value alignment um, and be notified as the parts of that come out. 
Very good. Get your get your core values aligned. That's a fantastic thing. Um, with that, we will see everybody next week, uh, Wednesday, Healthy You, What's Your Path, at 4 p.m. Eastern, all points around the globe. And we will say goodbye for Episode 15. See you, everybody. Thanks, Kristen and Tracy. Bye.